And with attitude, the question tonight is not even a thank you. Not a single, not, not even a thank you. A baker in Brookshire's one day noticed a young boy wandering around by himself. He called to him and inquired about his parents, from, and the boy retorted, retorted, retorted they're, they're just shopping. The baker continued to watch the young boy fiddle uh, with different displays while poking on packages and shuffling around. He thought perhaps he could keep him occupied, so he called over to the young boy and said, Would you like a cookie? Would you like a cookie? The boy somewhat reluctantly worked his way over uh, to spy the selection of fresh baked goods. He examined each of them through the glass, and then he looked up at the baker and said, I would like one of each. <laughs> Me, too. Me too. Somewhat taken back by the forwardness of the young boy, the baker responded he could only give him one cookie. One? What was the point of one, the boy thought, and said angrily, one, just one? Really? The baker, still somewhat confused by the response, was not sure, not sure really what to do. His attempt to be kind was being twisted in what appeared to look like he had done something wrong by offering the boy a free cookie in the first place. Wow, he thought, what an attitude. Hmm. After several minutes passed, the baker, in the attempt to move beyond the awkwardness of the moment, asked the boy, how about a chocolate chip cookie? The boy, still with a scrowl, finally responded, if all I can have is one, then I guess so, it'll have to be chocolate chip. The baker, with a pleasant smile, trying to place the previous issue out of his mind, presented the cookie to the boy, with no, with, and with no response, the young boy grabbed the cookie and turned and walked away. The baker then called out to the boy and asked, not even a thank you? To which the boy responded, you offered me the cookie, what am I thanking you for? Tonight I want to talk to you about great gratitude. <laughs> Thankful or grateful, either, neither, or both. Uh, we often hear people say that I'm doing all right from where I, where I came from. What, from where I started, I'm doing pretty good. We kind of measure ourselves in the world that way, don't we? He was very well off. She was a very successful business person. They did well for themselves. Often as our measuring stick of success, we, we base that on education or wealth or overall perceived success, right? How am I doing? It's funny, I was thinking about birth. Birth starting point, right? That's when we come to this world. And, and, and obviously, mother is sort of essential to be present there, right? I mean, kind of going to have to be there, right? Dad, hmm, might be optional. Doctor would be well and possibly even nurse. But out of those two or three or four people, that's really are all the ones that are really here when you come into this world, right? But you think about death. You've heard people say this. How many will be at, I'm wonder, wondering, how many would be at my funeral? How well... Was that person known? How popular were they? Or how loved were they? Again, a measurement to some degree of who we are in this life. When in reality, our measurement of all success, brilliance, and wealth will come down to just one basic choice. And that one basic choice would be, I believe or I do not believe. That's life, folks. Right in the middle. One choice. And if you're a Christian... It'll be added to how many souls did you influence for Christ? <coughs> Not as a negative, but as a positive. I've been given a gift. Whom can I share it with? Father God created our minds, and y'all know that, and our bodies that they can articulate cures for disease as well as, as, well as uh, invite product, invent products for our conveniences. Nevertheless, if you want to be truly successful, then understand the one thing most critical to fulfilling your success is to understand the gift of life. In that gift of life, understand this, the wisdom to accept it and the grace to share it. Now, that second part is often harder than the first part, but in some cases, they're both pretty hard. Sometimes it takes a lot of us to come to God because we have to humble ourselves to, to realize the need, I really need something. I don't have this under control. The second half, after we accept it, is the grace to forgive who we are, as I said earlier, and to actually share the Word of God with someone else, a family member, someone that you may not like, right? Mm -hmm. John 14, 27 this, this evening said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth you, I give unto you. Peace comes in a single choice, the choice to accept Christ. If, if, the, if the pressure of physical success overtakes the simplicity of spiritual focus, how can you have peace? If the pressure or the Attraction to physical success overtakes the simplicity of spiritual. What's simplicity of spiritual? 
I believe. God, can I share the word of God with you? Huh? No, it's much more complicated than that. No. No. For to have peace means to understand this world is what? Not a value, right? It comes more realistically the closer you get, doesn't it? It wakes you up, right? It shakes you a little bit. It tells you, hey, what you thought you were thought was important is not quite as what you thought it was, right? We begin to realize that hopefully, but see, here's the deal. If you have accepted Christ because in acceptance of Christ, what happens? Your eyes are open to the reality, to the love and the word of God. And that begins to change your perspective on what I've been doing. Because I'm telling you, folks, there's a lot of people just keep on pushing to the right to the end, right? I mean, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. They judge themselves by what they got, what they look like, how many people was at their funeral, how popular were they, right? People spend hours preparing for funerals and so forth. Y'all can do whatever you want. I'm out. Hmm? I love the concept, but Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Again, as I've told y'all before, y'all can argue which heaven, which level, and all that. All I know is I'm going. Amen. Bingo. You see, for us to have peace means to understand this world nor the things of it are any of any value. They can't sustain us. on our. All, all they're here for is to sustain us if we don't let them overtake us. I know by Revis's own testimony, he had a time in his life where the world overtook him. It overtook a lot of us, right? See, in Matthew 6, and if you're in Matthew 6 tonight, that's a beautiful passage of Scripture. I spent a lot of time in Matthew 6 when I was... Uh, coming to Christ, I will, I'll be honest with you. Uh, six. Starting, I'm going to refer to several different scriptures. This one is in 11, uh, verses 11 and 12. And in 11 and 12 in Matthew, if I have the right scriptures, yep. give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Notice the word daily. While forgiving ourselves and those around us today and every day, for our sins. Forgive me. Go home tonight. God, forgive me. Right? Clear it out. Whatever it might be, clear it out. If it's there, clear it out. Bad thoughts, bad, I mean, Thanksgiving's come up. Anybody have any evil thoughts about family they're going to see the next few days? Don't lie now. You're in church. Okay. God, forgive me. Why? Because I'm trying to prepare myself for the fact that when I have confrontation with that person, they may still be carrying something that they want to discuss. All I want to do is say, man, I'm sorry. I need to tell you about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Easily said in here, hard to do out there, right? right. But it's a fact of life. That's what it's daily, well, forgiving ourselves, cleaning that out. Because see, the, we understand that as you load physical pressures, responsibilities, right? As we load those properties, we add, we add responsibility to that. We invest our time and energy in that. Every, everybody's got that, right? Everybody cleans their house. Everybody tries to take care of their stuff, right? And the question is, how much, though? How much? How much? How much to care and maintenance and protect them and to store them and make sure everything is fine? Matthew, again, Matthew 6, look at verse 19. Verse 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up your treasures, lay your up, excuse me, but lay up yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where their thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your Heart. It's funny because most of us think of treasures, always think of pirate treasures, right? I don't know why, it just what I, comes to my mind. But it's, it's, it's items of wealth, is it not? It may, now, that doesn't mean it's your wealth may not be someone else's wealth, but you think like my ring, my ring's worth $100. Somebody else's ring might be worth $300,000. It may be able to cut glass and fly, I don't know. But the bottom line is we often put a lot of pressure on the wealth of the things we have, the importance or the sentimental value, right? When in reality, Christ was saying, in order to have that peace that we talked about in John 14, 27, in order to have that peace, we have to let go of what? This world. We have to. We have to. He knew the complications that were going to come with this. He knew what was coming, trying to maintain both a focus on our possessions as well as the world and the desire to have eternal life at the same time. If you look at, well, I don't have to turn there, but if you'll note it, if you look in Matthew 4.4, 4, Matthew 4.4, 4, it says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God himself. He said we would not worry with the material, excuse me, we should not worry with the material uh, focus as much as the spiritual opportunities. Hmm? 
He told us to be busy with his work. Again, now I'm speaking to the Christian. This is that call out point again, calling you back out. Hey, we all, this is what he said. I, Matthew 6, 11, forgive yourself today, right? I got caught up. Huh? I stayed on the phone three hours, whatever it was, trying to get this fixed or trying to get that fixed. I got caught up. I heard a headline this morning of, of something bad going on in the world. They're, they're everywhere, right? And my mind began to think, wow, man, this is bad. The world is bad. The politics are bad. Everything's bad. Well, hey, mm -mm. let me step back. Let me step back. Talk to God for a little bit. Reboot, right? Tim 2.0, Christ 3.0. Huh? Put myself back, move, right? Step back. You see, in Matthew 6, 24, it says, no one can serve two masters. Right. Huh? Now, we put a lot of pressure on this scripture. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will devote, uh, you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But the important part is whether you're into that or whether you're worried about it is the main issue. Are you putting him first in your choices? Right? I, I go back at and ask you to think about that word daily, daily, the daily battle, right? It is a daily, because Monday comes, and I don't know about you, but Fridays, I, it's like they're just one day in some cases, right? It's just one, you know, it's, it's one of those just boom, it's, it's, it's Friday. And did you take the time every day to renew your mind in the Word of God? See, you're going into, please forgive me, but to some degree, you're going into battle. This is the battle season. Hmm? You're going to go into members of your homes who are not saved. Huh? There are going to be things said. There are going to be actions done. And how hard would it be just to say, God, I'm just going to condemn you for that right now. I just, I just don't think you should do that right. But today I'm going to have to pull you back and say it's not your job to go in condemning. It's your job to go in loving. Let God take care of what he needs to clean out. He will. I promise you. Because everyone that's saved here tonight, when he came to you, you had some stuff. And some of you may still have some stuff. We have some stuff we like to keep. Little stuff we keep away, you know. But the bottom line, if you have some stuff, if you'll open it up, God will come in and flush that stuff out, right? Yeah. He will. And we see people all the time. We see each other. I've said this before. We see people that they wander off, and we're like, oh, where'd they go? And the issue is for us not to go, oh, where'd they go? It's for us to say, oh, would you come back? Yeah. See what I mean? Oh, would you come back, please? Because I'm afraid when you're out on the fringe, and this is really a concern of mine. When you're out on the fringe, that the world will pull you further and further away. You say, well, I'm a Christian. You are a Christian. But you have a place and a purpose, right? You have a place and a purpose to witness God. And when you're out there on the loan, the world will, 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 will pull you away and say, God, you don't really have to do that. It's not, this is all right. You know? You ever watch one of those episodes, uh, episodes, every one of those, those shows on TV, the sitcom type shows, and they start out, it's really kind of nice. And if you've seen the ones that kind of progress and start getting off, they wonder, right? Like, you're really getting into it, and about the seventh show, suddenly they introduce a new character, or they introduce some new language, or they introduce some new thought process. And you're like, well, man, I'm really, I'm invested in this show. I really like this show, right? See, that's how Satan works in our lives. I mean, exactly. He comes along and says, this is really nice. This is a really nice thing. This is really good. This is really good. And then suddenly what? It's not so nice anymore, is it? See, he pulls. He pulls. That's how the world works. That's why it's so important to say, well, Brother Tim, if you say that, then we shouldn't worry about the things of the world. Then we should just be penniless and poor. No. No, God has proven all through his Bible as well as in our life. As in this country. Just look at the wealth that's in this country. And like I told you last Sunday or Sunday before, we look at it as look what we did. You better consider, you better understand, look what God has allowed this country. So that's what's really at the pending hold right now is we think we got this covered. We got anything covered. And if we don't go back to God, sooner or later, read your history, God will say, I'm done. Right? I mean, Jonah went to save the, uh, the Ninevites, and then what happened 100 years later? God wiped them out. Why? They repented and then went back. It's all here, folks. They don't want you to read this book, but it's all right here. But see, that's when he says God has proven, uh, uh, has pr proven and has allowed this country. He's allowed us personal individuals. I mean, again, everybody has, you got a home, you got a house, got a car. See? And that all came with the direction of God first. In God we trust. God first. 
In God we trust. This is why when you consider Thanksgiving a day of thanking someone, who will you be most thankful to or thankful for? Or more importantly, what will you be most thankful for? What? What item in your life? Will it be God first? Right? Because there'll be a lot of people going, I, I got a new TV to, tomorrow to watch. And it, you know, it's 900 inches to watch the Cowboys and the Lions play. Right? I mean, it's huge, you know. I'm, I'm just saying, see, they're still blind. It's not, it's not for us to go in and say, hey, wow, you should, no. What it is to go in and say, I love you, I need to show you the love of God, right? There's a question I would say, or a statement I would make, if you were thinking about this from a thankful perspective. I'm very thankful for all that I have, or I'm very thankful for the promise that I have. You see, in humility, you can have both. I'm thankful for what I have. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Amen. Christianity is really coming to the reality of understanding who your Father is and who you are to Him and to what that He allows, which again, like our country, He's allowed us greatness, right? He allowed us greatness in our personal lives. All of these things... You can have both in the same thing. However, one of these statements is influenceable, influenceable by the condition hmm, of our physical situation and our perception of success and failure. It's influenced, right? See, and that is to say, what I'm trying to say is that if we live in the material side of all of it, then we allow the situations of our life, the circumstances of our life to change our emotions. We react to them accordingly. We react to them that way. It's, it, it makes us angry. This broke. It made me angry. This made me happy. This made me despondent. It's, do we allow the physical situation to persuade us in that direction? More importantly, do we allow the physical situation? I'm not well. I have health, health issues all of a sudden. I don't want health issues. I'm not, I lost my job. Right? Real life stuff. My wife left, and she didn't take the kids. Huh? Right? Somebody ate my bluebill. Right? When I say that, do we allow the physical situation to persuade? Do we remain thankful and content? There's that word. Do we remain thankful and content in Christ or ungrateful and ill-spirited because things did not go our way? I bet every one of you can think of someone that is bitter at the present moment about something in their life. Not necessarily in this room, but a family member, a friend, someone you've had business, someone you've just said, wow, he's always angry or upset. That's why, because things didn't go what? I had all this planned. I remember visiting with a friend a few years ago that was dying with cancer. He had made all these plans. He bought a trader and a boat. And he was going to fish. and He was going to do this. And he was going to do that. And boom, he was dead within three years of his retirement. See, it's a reality. Right? Angry. Viciously angry. This is not the way my life was supposed to go. The question is, can you be content? Can you be content? This can happen very much so when we forget to be thankful. I didn't find this, but I heard a preacher say it a few weeks ago, and I love it. He said when it came to Eve, one of the things that affected her more than anything was that she began to look at the one tree she couldn't have as opposed to all the trees that she could have. Some of you obviously have heard this before. I've never heard that. I thought that was beautiful, right? Because as humans, this is the problem we have a lot of times. We forget all that he's given us and we start looking at the one thing that we seemingly can't have and probably don't need. What we don't have or what we do have that becomes a big issue for us as Christians. Think about Psalms 106.1. 106.1. So FBI on Psalms 106.1. It's a midnight. Coming to you from the wolf man. No. Psalms 106.1. Colon 1. Verse 1. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He love, his love endures forever. This scripture is several different places in the Bible. It's also found in 1 Chronicles 16.34. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures. 
Most verses go on to list reasons why we should thank him, such as his love endures forever. He's good. He's merciful. He's graceful. He's everlasting. Psalms 100, colon 5, verse 5. I actually like point 0.5 better. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Feeling and expressing appreciation is good for us. Tomorrow, a day of thanksgiving is good for us, but as Christians, we should be thankful every day, if nothing else, for no other reason than just simply that I have salvation. Amen. See, reminding ourselves, going daily to remind that part, to, to, to forgive. See, Tim, it's all about sin. You've got to constantly ask for forgiveness of our sins and break the list. And, no, it's staying in contact with God. Father God, I love you. Thank you. I mean, see, because here's the deal. You can't really stay irritated if you're going to be thankful. You can't be bitter and thankful at the same time. If you are, something's wrong. You really can. See, it's, it's like, it's, it's in our best interest to remind ourselves that everything we have is a gift from Him. Right? Does it take some pressure off? Right? I mean, I need to get this done. I need to fix that. I need to... Everything that we've been given is because of Him. Again, right here. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above. What? The ability? Our abilities as humans alone. Like I said earlier, to, to articulate cures for diseases or to invent things, air conditioning and lights and all the stuff we had. All of those, it, it goes back to the fact, you know, you had to have something up here before you could do that. And we think, well, I'm highly educated. I educated myself. I'm, I'm not highly educated, obviously. But, right, I, you know, but we don't ever stop to say, Thank you, God, for creating a brain that has capacity to allow me to create these things. Think back to our opening story of the baker and the young boy. We are all appalled when we witness someone who acts like that, right? Don't we? The old man, the kid needs a spanking. And we witness around us, not just in children and our youth, but sometimes in we're. Ourselves. Adults. <laughs> We like to pin it on our pure children and say, they're just rebelliously. Oh, yeah. But here's the deal, folks. We are at some points in our lives, we get rebellious too. Because God says, here's what I want for you, and here's what we say, that's not what I want for me, God. So many focus on what can we get as opposed to being grateful for the blessings he's already given us. It, it, it's kind of a hopeless cycle sometimes of greed built on the foundation of what I deserve and what I don't have. Because honestly, that's where a lot of people live in this world. This is what I need. Why? Because I deserve it. Or I need it because they got it. As a matter of fact, I want what you got. That's really the new theme of the world. I really want what you got, Revis. I don't know what it is, but I want it. I'm just saying. You looked really happy with it. So, But anyway, before I get off on a squirrel hunt, <laughs> let, me, let me say this. Are we not sometimes like that with our Father? Really? We love Him? Are we grateful and thankful for the things that we do have? And do we use the word, listen to this, do we use the word please and thank you with our Father God? You know, sometimes we get caught up in the crisis, right? God, I need you. Like I said a few Sundays ago, oh God is not necessarily a prayer, right? If there's no heart, it's just words, right? But in that, I was really thinking about this, like this young boy here. Please, thank you. Please, may I have a cookie? I know this is really, I know you're like, what, what a little, but you get the point? Please and thank you. Do you have that level of relationship and that level of humility to talk to your Father God to say, thank you, Father. Please, would you bless me again, Father? See, I just realized all of this that I've been given, all of this that this church family's been given, to see the building full on Sunday morning, to see the opportunities that we have. You say, well, Tim, I don't always see them. Sure. I don't, I, oh, yeah, there's all kinds. If you want to pick, you get an ice kit. There's, there's plenty of places that you can crack and pick. Why? Because we're all people. But the bottom line is, do you see the opportunities that we're given over and over and over again to witness Christ, to be thankful for that opportunity? Thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you, Father, for my home, for my car, for my family. Thank you, Father, for all I do have. See how it changes your perspective when you say, my gosh, look at all I do have instead of, well, I'd really like to have this or I'd like to have more or I'd like to have it bigger. 
I was looking at some of the houses that I grew up in as a kid. I think they were like 800 square feet. Danny, I thought they were huge. I went back to Fort Worth to look at one of them one day with my oldest son, and he said, Dad, that's a tool shed. At that time, we lived in a 4,200 square foot house. 4,200 square foot is a big box. I called it the horse barn. It's a big square rectangle box in McKinney. It had an ugly house, but it was huge. Had a roof over my head. But when I was a kid, I said, but son, there was like eight people living in that little house. It was a home. We were grateful to have it. See, if, we're, if we act like this young boy without gratitude, we become arrogant and we become self-centered. See, thankful. I'm thankful. See, humility says, I'm thankful. My gosh, I'm thankful for what I have. I'm thankful at this point. We begin to believe that if we have, we, we, we begin to believe that we've achieved everything on our own, don't we? Yeah, Butch, we sound to sit back and go, well, you know, I've done pretty good for myself, right? From where I came, yeah. Hmm? Look at all, I got a truck and a car and two horses. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on. Hey, Tim, I like the saw bill that said grace plus attitude equals gratitude. So if you put some grace on your attitude, then you have gratitude. Gratitude, grace and attitude. Attitude equals gratitude. gratitude. Anyway, in closing now, I just want you to think about thankfulness keeps our hearts in the right relationship. It keeps our hearts in the right relationship with Jesus Christ himself, with the giver of all good gifts, right? Because giving things lets us appreciate what we do have. You know, we tend to focus on what we don't have, but really when we change our minds and start to look at what we do have, and then you add it to what your real goal in life is, which is after all the things that I thought I wanted to achieve, the one thing that I want to be able to say is, Father, I took your gift and I gave it to someone else. I want to influence. You say, well, Brother Tim, I'm not a soul winner. I don't talk to people. But you influence. Because, see, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're walking around bitter, nobody wants that. I'm a Christian. I'm happy. i got to go to church. Mm. Wow. Well, that... You ever use those words? I got no, I can't do that. I gotta go to church Sunday. Huh? I gotta go to church. I got to go to church Sunday because I'm a happy Christian. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Amen. See, we have a very merciful God, a very extreme merciful God. In 1 Thessalonians 5:18, he said, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for your for, for you in Christ Jesus. We are to be thankful not only for the things we have, but for the circumstances we don't like. And I'm going to wrap it up tonight with this little section right here. We are to be thankful not only for the things that we like. It's easy to be a great Christian when everything is going well. But when Goliath's standing in front of you and you can't find your rock. Huh? Kick him in. And this is the very essence. I don't think I hit it on it hard enough. But the difference between this is finding, as Paul told us, Paul told us in, let me find it right quick. Got to flip a page here. Got too many books in my hand. Oh, I didn't put him in here. Sorry. Well, anyway, Paul told us one, one key ingredient, right? What was that? To be content. To be content. See, content's not happy, content not sad, content's not a, content is that I put myself. Why is that? Because for the circumstances we don't like, I have a father who will sustain me through those moments if, if I'll give it to him. Right? James 1.12 said, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, right? The test. Remember the name we were talking about uh, uh, Goliath? Remember the lion and the bear? So he didn't send David to do battle just all by himself, right? He'd already tested him. And David had already what? He'd already tested his God. So when he arrived there, he's like, wait, I got expectations, and I got confirmation, and I got confidence that this man is going down. Why? Power of God, right? Blessed is the one who per perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We are grateful, not expectant. He will strengthen us to endure. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. 
Therefore, I will, not, I will boast all more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Thank you, Father Jesus. I can't do this by myself. And personally, I'm really tired of trying. <laughs> See, because this is, you know, you know how we, but when you put all this back together and you say, if my people will call on my name, if my people will show their weakness and say, Father God, we do not have this answered, then Father God will fix this problem. He's done it over and over and over again. Contentment states that regardless of my physical, I am well because of the promise of my Father God through the forgiveness of His Son who paid my way. Therefore, our, cont our contentment comes in full circle in one important fact. Our ability to accept our condition, not because it's pleasant, but because of the promise in Christ that we have. Easy to say, difficult to do, but extremely true. Extremely true. Closing to that, I would say in Philippians 4, 10 through 14, Paul's writing, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that has, excuse me, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. Whatever circumstances. The next time you witness someone ungrateful for that, for what they don't have, would you remind them of what they do have as a person? And that person might be you, right? It might very well be you, huh? Because if we're disappointed in life, what you achieve, what you want, have you taken inventory on your friends, perhaps family, a place? All, have you really looked at where you're at in your life? Of all the things that you do have. See, if there's an issue that you just have one cookie, but do you want them all? Instead of being content with what God gave you. In closing tonight, Matthew 20, 19, it says, so let the last will be first and the first last. For many were called, but few are chosen because the greatest attribute you can have is salvation. The second, sharing your salvation by your grateful attitude with those around you, by your grateful attitude of those around you. Do you have everything you want? No, I don't. Does your body hurt? Yes, it does. Do I have problems? Yes. Do I have children, bills? Oh, yes. Yes. Then how can you remain content in your life? Because of the promise of Father God. The promise of Father God. Jesus gave us an eternal life. And sometimes he really wonders from us, not even a thank you. Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to speak your word. God, thank you for the promise. Tonight as we leave, God, please strengthen every person here that the light shines, that they can't contain it, that's, it just, that, that people want to know what's wrong with you. Let them share, God. We pray for the family events the next few days, God, again, that there will be peace, love, and, and, and again, an opportunity to be thankful, to be truly thankful in our homes. Not just for the things of this physical world, but the one that is most important, the promise of salvation, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.